You've been busy since your basketball career and starting Granity Studios and a lot going on, an Oscar award winning filmmaker. And now you're launching the Wizard series, a fantastic fantasy book, uh, part of a series of books that are going to be coming out geared for teaching children some life lessons. Yeah. And what was the inspiration for Granity? Well, the inspiration for Granity was how do we create stories that uh, raise a certain awareness of how to deal with the journey within you know, the emotional journey. I feel like a lot of kids, um, you know, we teach them certain actionable things, basketball, soccer, football, whatever the case may be, but we're missing the emotional component that comes along with that, right? The anxiety that comes along with that, you know, the anger or the love and all these emotional things that take place from play to play. We're missing that teaching moment. And so the best way to do it, at least what I found with my children, is not to tell them about it, because after a while, they're just like, all right, all right, yeah, 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 I don't want to hear it no more. But instead, you kind of put it into something that's creative, right? And so through entertainment, through fantasy, through magic, you start creating life lessons that are easier to digest. Yeah, in a way, it feels like you're mentoring all of us through your works at Granity, and, and the book itself has a number of characters in the book. Do you feel that the characters in the book you're drawing from personally, uh, teammates, mentors along the way? Yeah, it's a combination, a combination. So the, 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 the coach himself, Rolla B. Wizenard, is somebody that I was inspired by some of the coaches that I've had in the past, namely Phil Jackson. Right. Right, and... The name Wizenard actually was inspired from Phil. I mean, Phil was a big Zen guy. You go in a locker room, he's like burning sage and all sort of <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, dude, you know, they might drug test us at any minute. Like, I don't know what you're putting in these incense. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know. Um, but he's a big Zen guy. And then another great mentor, the person I looked up to and studied a lot, was John Wooden, who was known as the yeah. Wizard of Westwood. And so I took the Wizard of Westwood and the Zen guy, and I combined those things and created Wizenard. Okay. Right. So a lot of it's inspired by those two coaches and Bill Russell as well. And then the kids themselves, yeah, there's a lot of me there. And there's also a lot of some of the teammates that I've had in the past. Um, I pulled a lot of inspiration from my daughter's team that I coach now, 12-year-old girls team. Okay. And uh, you'll see a lot of those same kind of characteristics within the characters themselves. It was something you mentioned about how the – Try to instill these lessons in your children, and they're getting tired of hearing the those lessons, right? But to be able to put them in the form of a story where you can emotionally invest in the characters, in their journey, and then learn from them through these narratives is a very powerful thing, and it's something that we've been discussing on the show for a while now. Yeah, we all have this hero's journey that we're on this yeah. movie that we're living and it's amazing to be able to create a story that encapsulates your hero's journey and all the lessons you've learned along the way. Yeah. Thank you, man. No, it's, it's a, it's, you know, it's funny when it comes to, to the art of creating, you have to have kind of this left brain, this right brain mm -hmm. approach of creativity. Right. But then as you said, in the hero's journey, it does involve a lot of structure. Right. Right. Absolutely. So you also got to start, you got to be fundamentally sound when it comes to telling your story and make sure you're hitting the beats that are necessary, making sure you're taking the, the, the reader or the viewer through a journey of character growth. And so, you know, you gotta sit down, you gotta map it all out, you gotta figure out what's gonna happen, not only in this book, but what are gonna happen in subsequent books. Right. You know, and uh, it, it's fun. It's fun mapping all that out, man. Is this something that, that has been, you've been working on for a while now, that it's always been in the back of your mind? Yeah, it has been, uh, during my last year, uh, playing is when I wrote the whole world. Okay, it's about two thousand years of history. I sat down and uh, thought about you know, what it is that I wanted to create, how I wanted to create it, and came up with the magic, the rules for the magic, and how it relates to sports, right? And and um, and then from that, I started thinking of characters. I mean, I mean, you guys know. I mean, it all starts with the character. You can have the best plot in the world, mm -hmm. the coolest looking world. You know, that the, anybody's ever seen. But if the characters aren't ringing true, it doesn't work. Right. If they're not relatable, it's yeah. not a great story. Yeah. And I feel like one of the big lessons in this first book in the series is really the characters struggling to overcome their fears. Yeah. Yeah. In your youth days in basketball, what were the biggest fears that you were struggling in overcoming? Well, um, you know, I learned at an early age um, from something that actually has nothing to do with basketball, but everything to do with it. I was in a karate class. And I was just starting out, I was a white belt, 
And for some reason, like we have these days during the week where you, you know, everybody kind of sits in a, a circle and you duke it out with another belt. <laughs> you work on all the things that you were just working on. And so I was fairly talented, right? So the guy goes, okay, sensei, all right, you're going to go up against this guy. And this guy's a brown belt. And he's like two years old. And I'm like, what the? I'm not going to fight this dude, man. He crazy? Like, no, I'm not, you know. And now you have the headgear on. You got all this stuff on, right? You got foot gloves on, the whole thing, right? <laughs> and uh, I was freaking out, completely freaking out. And he told me at the beginning of class, so the whole class I'm freaking out. And so uh, I wind up fighting this guy. And I get my butt kicked, right? But I remember, I was about eight years old, in the car on the way home. I remember thinking that my imagination... Um, made it worse in my own head it was going to be the worst thing ever then i actually fought him and it wasn't it's like it was okay you know i did pretty i did okay right but that taught me a very early lesson is that we can get in our own heads so much we can psych ourselves out so much we can almost talk ourselves into a fearful situation right. as opposed to just being and, and i've never forgotten that lesson and in Muse, you touch on having to travel so much as a kid and really finding solace in basketball do you feel like your imagination was also playing a big part in your development in those days? Oh my God, yes, because it involves playing a lot uh, by yourself. You right. Know? You know, in Italy at the time, soccer was, and still is, I mean, it's the, the best thing since sliced bread, yeah. right? And so when you go to the park, there's not a lot of kids back then that wanted to play basketball, right? So I had a lot of room for imagination. And so when I'm out there shooting, I'm imagining at the time being in the forum, playing at the Boston Garden, you know, here in the crowd, you know, acting as if I was the play-by-play -play announcer. And so there certainly was a lot of imagination there. Yeah, and I know a big part of that as well was identifying those weaknesses in your game and imagining some of the other players you looked up to and the skill set that you were hoping to develop. Yeah, you, I, I watched a lot and I studied a lot. You know, at the time I didn't think it was studying. It was just like, you know, I'd rather be doing nothing else. I wanted to watch Bird. I wanted to watch Magic, Olajuwon, Barkley, you know, Robinson, Baylor, on and on and on and on. And I try to uh, imitate those moves. Right. You know, and my left hand was weak. I had to work on my left hand. That's what I did. And um, it was just fun. I, I'd just rather be doing any, nothing else. I think it's that where it becomes, it's the obsession, right? It's yeah. like, we wouldn't want to be doing anything else. And everything that we're doing in that moment is pure joy. Yeah. And it takes us away from wherever we are and completely envelops us. Yeah. But and, isn't that, that's, that's such a, you know, uh, it's hard to find that thing that you love that much, isn't it? I mean, that, that's kind of the key to this whole deal, mm -hmm. right? You, you, and, and for those of us that are really lucky, you can find what that thing is at a very early age. Other times, it requires a lot more work. It requires a lot of trying and experimenting. Right. But when you find that thing, it's like, right? You don't have to wake up in the morning and psych yourself up like, oh, man, I got to do this today. All right, I got to get jazzed up. You know, like every morning you wake up, and you're like, I can't wait. I can't wait. And, and that's like, you know, that's more than 80% of the battle, I think. I think that also if you're able to find something like that when you're younger, uh, that when, as you get older, you can understand that process and know what it's going to take for you to get focused into something. At least that's it's, it's how it's been for us and just discovering a lot of new stuff for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, having struggles early on creates that strength and resilience that you're yeah. going to depend on as you become an adult. Yeah, those are, that's, that's actually extremely important too because it's part of the story as well is that you don't run from those moments. Yeah, right. You don't run from them. You embrace them, right? You got to embrace the storms. You know what I mean? Yeah. The fears that we have, the moments of suffering, they're all part of the process. They're all part of growth. It's nature, right? You got to be able to handle those things, man. Now, Obviously, we know a lot about your relationship with Phil over the years, two stints working together. How does it feel now that you're a coach and coaching your daughter's basketball team? You know, it's, it's funny. I, I just sent him <laughs> a video, a, a clip of our girls playing. It was like a, like a nine and a half, ten minute clip of the girls playing that I sent to him. And I just said, just to make you smile. And he watched it and he responded in very typical Phil way. <laughs> saying they, uh, they move the ball extremely well. They understand how to deploy the defense, right? Like very, like very matter of fact, you, you know, like really looking at the execution of how they format triangles, how they read angles and right. all sorts of stuff. And he said, you should be very, very proud. The girls are doing a great job. 
Um, so I, I keep them involved in, uh, right. in how the girls are progressing for sure. And as a teammate, you were known for being intense. Is that intensity waned with your children now and coaching them? No, it's different. So like as a player, the intensity comes from the action. Like you're on the right. court, you're entrenched in that kind of that, that combat, right? As a coach, it's different. As a coach, my responsibility is to teach them how to fish. That's my responsibility. Right. Give them the fundamentals, teach them how to think. And then when they go out and play, I let them coach themselves because they have to be able to problem solve. And when I see things that are incorrect, I just hold on to them and then we can work on them in practice, right? So it's having the patience to allow them to go out there to think independently, uh, to make mistakes and all this other stuff. And then you can teach them patiently um, you know, in practice every day. It's funny, Johnny and I learned a new term called lawnmower parents, yeah. this idea of parents foreseeing the adversity and getting ahead of it before their children Ooh. can even feel the adversity. Exactly. No bueno. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> sounds a lot different than the perspective yeah, you're bringing. No bueno. I, I think our job as parents is, is guidance, right? You allow your kids to go out there and to live. You allow them to make mistakes. And then you're kind of there to help guide them through that journey. Right. It's a journey that they have to take. It's inevitable. They have to right. go through this journey. I think it's our job to just try to try to help guide them through it. That's all. And you're famous for having an alter ego, Black Mamba, yeah. and compartmentalizing what was going on in that part of your career personally so that when you stepped on the court, you were all business. Yeah. And that alter ego changed the arc of your history, your career in, yeah. in basketball. That imagination with Black Mamba, it sounds to me, has been what's ignited this flame with Granity. Yeah, it's, it's certainly part of it. You know, like I, I used to write ads a lot. I used to write ads. So I had an ad agency a long, long time ago, and uh, I wrote ads for Nike, my Nike ads, things of that nature. So writing and imagination was always a part. Storytelling was always there. And uh, yeah, so the Black Mamba stuff all comes from that sort of imaginary world of creating something else, right? But I also learned from that that even through imagination, things must come from truth, right? Who am I on a basketball court? I'm this thing, <laughs> right? So it has to be anchored in, in, in a form of true, truth. And, uh, and that's what I try to do with what I'm creating now. And for the audience listening who hasn't had a chance to check out your book, we can pre-order it on Amazon, the yeah. Wizard series. It's part of five. Uh, what are the biggest life lessons that you hope the audience takes away from these books? Well, the, the biggest journey that you'll see the characters take, which is really important for young men, right? Now, the rest of the novels are all for, uh, I have female protagonists because okay. of my daughters. You know what I mean? Like, I just <laughs> can't help but write characters that are like based around my daughters. But um, for this series, I felt it was very important for young men. Because as young men, we are taught at a very early age that any sign of vulnerability is a sign of weakness. Right? Crying, that's weak. Don't do that. Right. Right. And so I think it's very important for these young men to go through this journey of self-acceptance first and foremost. Right? Because there are a lot of things that are personally holding them back that they've buried, either consciously or subconsciously, that's holding them back from reaching their full potential as young men and as athletes. And until you square with those, You'll never hit that full stride. So the first one is a really big, important story about self-acceptance. And then from that self-acceptance, it teaches you empathy and compassion. Because even though I can't see what magical journey you just went on, I know that you've gone through one. Because I have as well. So that helps me better understand and relate to others. And then we'll progress to being able to have the bravery to share what it is, what, what journey it is that you, you've just been on. And with the relationships with your teammates that you drew from in this book and, and now looking at relationships off the court, do you feel like you've changed the way that you handle some of your friendships and relationships? Oh Obviously, God, yes. you're well known for your intensity in the locker room. Yes, yes. I, I, I've had to mature as um, my playing days went on, right? Because you start understanding that there are lives outside of the game, right? There are personal things that happen in people's lives that are... Uh, manifesting themselves through the game. And uh, as a good teammate, I had to understand that and say, okay, let me listen to these guys. Let me, let me get a better sense for who they are as people. Um, because that's, that's really the true way to, to, to bring out the best in somebody else is to first understand that person. Right, where they're coming from. Exactly. Uh, was, was there a, a point in your career that brought that lesson to the forefront where you realize that that you're going to have to open up to these, these other stories and, and 
to the to your teammates and yeah. what they have going on having having children yeah gotcha. you know because you 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 have to think um outside of yourself you have an additional you have a responsibility and, and you know when you have kids it's like this responsibility is the most important thing in the world right and and how do you raise um how do you raise a young child you know what do you do so you become consumed with their life. You become consumed with trying to provide them with proper guidance and proper care. And it changes you. It changes you as a person, man. And, and, and it makes you um, 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 think more outwardly versus inwardly. Yeah. And you talk a lot in, in Muse about the sacrifices that were made throughout your career, whether it's not spending time with your family, not spending time with your friends, not going on vacations, those famous workouts that yeah. your teammates dreaded. Yeah. Um, in that, you know, hard work gets us there part of the way. But to achieve greatness, especially now, we look everywhere, hustle this, hustle that, work hard. What else is it that, that goes beyond just the hard work, the effort? Well, it, it's, it's trying to balance and win all facets of life. It's really hard to do, right? Like, how do you succeed at your craft, but how do you also have a stable family? Right. You know, I mean, that, that's like the never that's the that's the gazillion dollar question. How do you balance those two things, man? And um, and I think that's the part that um, gets missed a lot. I mean, we all talk about the hard work. We all talk about, OK, be this, be that, be this, be that. But what I figured out as I got older is it's not about working hard in terms of putting in long hours, but it's about working smart. It's about working smart. When you work smart, it gives you more time to be able to spend with your family, right? And have that consistency because it's important to win all facets, man. And as we talk about this whole universe that you've created, what are you most excited about happening in this book series? Um, uh, watching how young children respond to them, you know, particularly young athletes. Like I was a young athlete and it was like, I mean, you'd have to pin me down to get me to read a book. <laughs> Right. You know, I was like, no, oh, I'm, I'm, I want to run. I want to yeah. play. It's got nothing to do with me. I don't, you know. So I think finally creating something in the market that is centered around young athletes. Finally, something that they can sit down and say, OK, not only am I learning a life lesson from this, which we all know kids don't really care about. Right. They care about having fun while you're consuming content and that it's centered around something that they actually enjoy doing and do. Right, so seeing their reactions to it is what I'm really looking forward to. And and how did your kids react to the the book? Did they put it down? No, they they loved it. So I, like I wrote it with them. Mm. You know, so they so were a lot part of the, the stories process. Come from them, the dialogue, the conversation between each other. I mean, that's like a lot of our conversations and how we talk in the same sense of humor and cadence. And, um, so a, a, a great deal of all of my series are inspired by my children. So. And are there any teammates that made it into the book in, in characters that you're... Yeah, there, there are bits and pieces of them, certainly. I mean, you know, I've, I remember having a teammate who could work and work and on his shot all day long, but as soon as the game starts, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Or I had a teammate that, um, you know, practice starts at 10.30, they show up at 10.30. All right, practice ends at 1, they leave at 1. Right. Conventional wisdom would say, OK, call him a lazy bum and get him out of here. You know what I mean? Right. But what you come to find out is that there are actually other things that 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 are truly the reason why he doesn't want to apply himself and do extra work because he's more so afraid of the failure. Like if I really put myself into this thing 110 percent and it's still not good enough, then how do I feel about myself? Right. Right. So th there's a there's a lot of things that I picked up and, uh, and put into the book. And, and having a career, a professional career especially, that starts at such a young age and being yeah. forced into the spotlight. I know one of the things that Johnny and I talk a lot on the show is how to foster the right relationships with positive, supportive people and how to weed out the negative relationships and yeah. the negative influences. And obviously some of your stature is going to have people from all walks of life wanting a piece of you. Yeah. How do you assemble that inner circle of people that you trust, whether it's a project like this book or uh, in, in other areas of life? Yeah, you know, the people, you know, you can feel it. So people have a certain energy about them. And when there are people in the world that are focused and like have a, I wake up in the morning with a purpose, this is what I'm doing. You can feel that energy, right? You can feel it because it's a kindred spirit. So those are the people that I tend to work with a lot. And if you don't have that, I can sense it. I can sense it. Right. But we're also very disciplined. If you're a person that's very distracted, 
hanging around the wrong crowd, um, um, not having that sense of purpose, we don't want to be around it. We don't want to be around it. Yeah, because that stuff will bring you down, man. Stuff will bring you down. So we're, we're very, very disciplined, very, very focused on finding, you know, writers, editors, story artists, you name it, yeah. that, that have a, like, true, true passion for what it is that they do. I think you mentioned earlier of, of being excited to get up every day, to, to, yeah. go, to get after it. That is something that you're going to be able to see in people. I mean, the, how they approach their day, how, 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 you know, how they feel about getting, getting out there, how, what time are they going to sleep to be prepared to take it on. And it's certainly, we've been discussing it on the show, if, if you're afraid to go to bed because of what you're dreading the next day, the, the, that next day should be spent in fixing that. Right, 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 right. right. Versus hiding from it. Right. Let I me mean, just stay in the bed. If I stay in the bed, it'll pass on its own. <laughs> nope. Not who we want around nope. us. No, nope. no. Now, you, you claim that you, you viewed the Achilles injury as your Mount Everest, and that's a fascinating mindset. Do you feel throughout your career you had to create these Mount Everest in your mind to really reach that greatness? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you have like winning championship when you start the season. Um, that's the mountain, right? Now that mountain is made up of a million little steps, right, and little goals along the way. Um, but, yeah, I certainly do that. You, know, you establish your mountain, and then after that, you don't look to the summit. Forget about it. You can't even see it. You just focus on the next step in front of you, right? You put one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, and you just keep your head down. You keep working. You keep working. You keep working. The next thing you know, you find yourself at the top of the mountain. And what's your, your Mount Everest right now? Right now is the stories, right? building the studio. How do we do that right? piece by piece? And, you know, some days and I'll sit in the office, I'm like, man, this is such a long journey, <laughs> long yeah. journey. You say, just focus on the basics. What are the basics? The Wizard Art series. The novel's done. Bring it to market. What are those steps? Right. The other not. So the three novels that we're releasing this year are all finished. They're all finished. So now it's about executing. Right. It's about execution. And surrounding yourself with the team members who will execute. But see, that's the beautiful thing is that we, we've been very, very fortunate to be able to do that. We have a great team have a great team and so you just kind of you know you trust the process you trust their creativity and you just turn them loose I mean it's really my job to make sure that they're pushing themselves every single day so when I say um, you know uh, 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 you have no restrictions on creativity be as creative as you want yeah in design and you know right whatever and they'll Oh, okay. And then they come back and go, is this okay? And I'm like, no, no, I don't think you're understanding me. Like, <laughs> you know, I am not a designer. Right? right. You have to tell me, is this the best work you can do? If it is, awesome. Right? So you got to hold yourself accountable. Um, but that's what we're going through now, and it's fun. Yeah, it's certainly a, a different challenge than the athletic pursuits earlier in your career. Yeah. When, when you were facing retirement, realizing that this was going to be behind you, what were you, you thinking about the second act in your career? Well, you know, I was thinking all the wrong stuff. Like, all right, what's the, be what's the biggest industry I can get into? Right. Right? How can we generate the most revenue sort of thing? Wrong. And I kept running into a dead end. I don't know what I'm going to do. Wake up every morning, I don't know what I'm going to do. And finally, I just said, okay, what, it is, what is it that you love to do? I love to tell stories. Love it. Love it. All right, so what the heck does that mean? <laughs> right? So my wife asked me, says, all right, well, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to be a storyteller. She goes, Pfft. all right, so let me get this straight. So when we fill out a form, or Natalia is at school, she has to fill out a form. It says, what is your dad's occupation? She's going to write, storyteller? <laughs> is that what you're telling me right now? I'm like, yeah, I guess. I mean, it worked well for Walt, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> She's like, you are not Walt Disney. Yeah, I know, I know. Not but, yet. You know, you get, but you get the idea. Right. And so once uh, I made that decision, then everything became about that. How do we just tell stories that are going to inspire another generation of athletes? I love that. I mean, we our last month, each month we do a different theme. And last month was happiness. And it's about finding passions and waking up to be excited to go out there and how that's going to happen. Did you go through a, a time where as you were waking up as you were going through the day like this is not working i'm not happy this is because um, i'm not i'm obviously not doing what i should be doing yeah for my last season of playing basketball yes and that's when i knew it was time to retire you know what i mean mm -hmm. like it's that moment i had that and i was like all right time to hang it up not look back right all right so that's how that decision was made 
and and so but now no like i was going through the whole year writing 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 right on yeah um you know uh, dear basketball producing that right so like the day after my last game you know um i was on a phone call with john williams and glenn keen like, working on the production for dear basketball so it was, it was like after one thing we just move right to the next right on and on we go and do you find yourself being a, a perfectionist and like, oh, I, I, I'm not sure I can release this yet. I'm not sure it's right. And this creative process, obviously, it's a lot different than working on a jumper. Um, for writing, yes. So like going every single, going over all the words, right? So like Dear Basketball, for example, when I wrote that, I truly did follow the hero's journey. I just, I just did it in five minutes, right? So if you look at the structure of the piece that I wrote, you'll see the same thing. You'll see the same thing. You see the call to adventure, you'll see all of that stuff in there. Um, and just hitting all those beats in a five minute span. Um, but I was an absolute perfectionist when it came to that. Like every word must <laughs> yeah. be yeah, well cared for. Uh, the rhythm, the cadence. The one thing I did know is I wanted to end it with a like five, four, three, two, one. Because in my mind, I was like, John Williams is going to crush that. <laughs> he is going to crush it. I don't know how, but I just know he will. You know, like that sort right. of thing. And uh, but then after that, you know, you, you work with people that are the same way. Like, I mean, John Williams, <laughs> you know, and Glenn Keane are perfectionists at what they do. They're so crap. you just you just step yeah. back and let them let them be them. That's all. And. I, I feel that with all of this going on, creative and raising a family, what, what do you do with your free time now outside of those two? Well, I coach Emmys. my daughter's basketball team. <laughs> no, but outside of that, like we, we, we'll do a lot of things together as a family. Like we, we love going to, to movies. Okay. Um, we love going to shows. Um, we love uh, trying new restaurants and, uh, you know, or sitting at home and playing Uno. We're a big Uno family. Okay, family uh, card games. Yeah, yeah, we, we love that so sort awesome. of stuff. We're like play headbands and, you know. So we just try to do fun things with each other, um, which becomes harder and harder because the kids' schedule's busier than mine. Yeah. You know, uh, but we try to find those those kind of intimate moments as a family. And how does the, the inner family competition work? Obviously, you're known for being tenaciously oh, dude, competitive. Man, man, listen, if, if you think like, you know, if, People that watch my kids play sports and say, okay, they're really competitive. And they say, oh, yeah, I, well, I wonder why. I'm saying, yeah, because you haven't met their mama. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as every bit as competitive as I am when it comes to that stuff, man. I, I won't sit next to her when it comes to Uno. <laughs> if I got to make her pick up two, oh, or pick up, you're like, a look. oh, yeah. Oh, no. Mm -mm. It's not going to be good. That famous look you gave on the court, you're getting back now in Uno. She gets me, she hits me with the eyebrow. Oh. She's got that eyebrow. I, and you know. Boop, that thing pops up. You're like, you know what? Hey, Gigi, you want to switch seats? <laughs> switch seats. You can place your mother. <laughs> now, mentorship was a huge part of your basketball career. Who do you consider mentors now in this second act? You know, when I first had the idea of starting a studio, um, the first person I spoke to was Oprah and how she went about building Harpo. And she was very patient with me. And we sat on the phone for about an hour and a half. And she walked me through her journey of how she built it. Um, other great mentors are people like Shonda Rhimes, um, who is, you know, uh, the empire that she's built over the years, right? And talking about character development and how to write story and how to build teams and how to grow teams. Because right? the other thing is, you know, bringing in, bringing in young writers and allowing young writers to develop and all of a sudden they become showrunners and all this stuff. And how do you do that? Um, uh, Johnny Ives from Apple, Tim Cook. You know, I'll pick up the phone and call them when it comes to structure of the company. How do you create a company that is that that is moving in one direction versus a company that is fractured and siloed and all this other stuff? And uh, I've been very, very lucky to have some great mentors in my life. Debbie Allen's another one. Um, very, very lucky. And are you actively mentoring any of the young basketball players in the league? These yeah. Days? So like I'll bring a lot of, a lot of young guys will come out in the summertime and spend two, three days, some, some cases a week. Uh, and we'll work together every single day. And like during the season, I'll get phone calls or I'll get text messages every now and then, uh, Kyrie Irving, James Harden, all these guys, uh, that want me to take a look at a piece of film or just have a question just about team dynamics and, challenges that they may be facing because you know 20 years I've pretty much oh, yeah. I've seen a lot yeah <laughs> I've seen absolutely. a lot I've seen a lot so I try to talk to the guys as much as I can Giannis is another one um so yeah I try to spend enough much time as I can with those guys I was curious 
in that studio when everyone's working and, and doing their thing and, and trying to create a creative atmosphere, do you feel yourself bringing in some of the Phil Zen into that room to let everyone do their thing? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, not yet. I haven't had to <laughs> get the burn any going yet. Yet. <laughs> we, you know, we already kind of have that. Like, you get certain creative people and they're kind of doing that on their own yeah. anyway, you know? So uh, for me, it's just constantly reinforcing that we are a creative company and, and you know, everything that we invest, things that we build is all centered around making sure the story is, uh, is king. Right. Making sure the design elements, we, we try to do everything to keep you immersed into the story. Um, but when you see the book, I love telling this because it, it just shows how maniacal we are. I mean, we spent two weeks on designing the barcode on the book. Just the barcode, just the barcode, because we didn't want to create something that pulled you out of the story, even if it right is on. a barcode. Right. right. Everything must be from this world. So Every little detail. Everything. I love it. Thank you for joining us. We yeah. really appreciate it. It's appreciate been an honor. And Absolutely. we're excited to catch the rest of the series and, and see where the Wizenard series goes. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Right Absolutely. Absolutely.